So, Dr. you a great deal of your work, of course, are aware of the fact that in your early work, uh, you were, to some, at least, in association with Dr. Sigmund Freud. And I know it would be of great interest to many of us to hear a little bit about how you happened to hear of Dr. Freud and how you happened to become involved with some of his work and ideas. Well, as a matter of fact, it was in the year 1900, in December, uh, soon after Freud's uh, book about uh, dream interpretation had come out, that I was asked by my chief, Professor Pleuler, to give a re review of the book. I studied the book uh, very attentively, and I didn't understand many things in it, um, which were clear to all to me. But uh, from other uh, parts, I got the impression that this man really knew what he was talking about. And uh, I thought uh, uh, that this is certainly uh, a masterpiece. Uh, uh, full of future. Yes. I had no idea then of uh, ideas of my own. I was just uh, in, it was just when I began to uh, my career as an assistant yes. uh, in the psychiatric clinic. And then uh, I began with uh, experimental psychology or psychopathology. I uh, applied the experimental association method by Wood uh, and the same that has been applied in the in Grappelin's uh, psychiatric clinic in Munich and, uh, and uh, uh, I had the results and uh, that there is a reaction, a certain reaction to a stimulus world. That uh, is more or less an interesting. But the interesting thing is why people could not react to certain stimulus yeah. words or in an entirely uh, inadequate way. And then I began to study these places in the experiment where the attention or the capability apparently of the test person began to wave or to disappear. And I found that soon out that uh, it is matter of intimate personal affairs people were thinking of or which were in them even if they momentarily did not think of them when they were unconscious with other words that nevertheless an inhibition came from the unconscious and hindered the expression in speech yes and then i uh, in examining all these cases uh, uh, as carefully as possible i saw that uh, it was a matter of what Freud called repressions. Yeah. I also saw what he meant by symbolization. And then um, I wrote a, a book about the psychology of uh, the dementia precox, it was yeah. called that, now it's schizophrenia. Yeah. And I sent the book to Freud and wrote to him about my association experiments and how they confirmed his theory thus far. Yes. And, uh, and that is how it began, my friendship with Freud began. Yes. Now one of the, uh, of course, uh, very fundamental ideas in uh, the original psychoanalytic theory was Freud's conception of the libido as sort of a broad psychic sexual energy. Well, you see, in the beginning I uh, had naturally certain prejudices against his uh, conceptions. Um, and after a while, I overcame them. Uh, I could do that from uh, owing to my biological training. Yes. And I, I could not deny the importance of, of the sexual uh, instinct, you know. Yes. Uh, but later on, I saw that it was very one-sided. Because, you see, man is not only governed by the sex instinct. There are other instincts as well. For instance, in biology, as you see, the uh, nutritional instinct is just as important as the sex instinct. Also in primitive societies, sexuality plays a role much more uh, than, than food. Food is the all-important uh, interest and desire. Yeah. Sex, that is something I can have everywhere. They are not shy. 
But the food is, uh, was, was, is difficult to obtain, you see? Yes, yes. And so it is the main interest. Yes. And then in other societies, for instance, uh, I mean, in civilized societies, the power drive plays a much greater role than sex. Yes. For instance, there are many uh, big businessmen who are impotent, even, yes. because uh, their whole energy is going into, into money-making. Yeah. Or, or uh, dictating the laws to everybody yeah. else. Yeah. That's yeah. much more interesting than affairs with women. So, you see, the inferior uh, Dr. Adolf, the younger, the weaker, naturally had a power complex. Yeah. He wanted to be the successful man. Freud was a successful man. He was on top, and so he was interested only in pleasure. Yeah. in the pleasure principle, yeah. and while Arthur was interested in the power five. Yeah. Sure enough. I see. In other words, you feel that it's sort of a, a function of his own personality to some degree. Yeah, it is, uh, it is quite natural. You yeah. see, it is one of the two ways how to uh, deal with reality. Yeah. Either you make reality an object of your pleasure, if you are powerful enough already, yeah. or you make it uh, an object of your desire to to, to, to grab it. Yes, yes. Now, um, of course, some uh, observers have thought that perhaps the patients that Dr. Freud saw in Vienna of this period were often individuals who were repressed sexually. Oh, yes. And, that, and that perhaps that so many of these patients having been of this type, yes. uh, that this may have been one thing that sort of reinforced Dr. Yeah. Freud's ideas. Well, this is uh, certainly so. Uh, that in the end of the Victorian age there was a, a reaction going over the whole world uh, against the, uh, the taboos, the sex taboos, yeah. one call, yeah. call yeah. Uh, One didn't understand anymore properly why, why or why not. Yeah. And uh, uh, it belongs into that time. Uh, a sort of liberation of the mind of such taboos. The research comes to the question of the unconscious. Uh, there, things become necessarily blurred. Yeah. Because the unconscious is something which is really unconscious. Yeah. <laughs> and so you, you have no object, you yeah, see nothing. Yeah. No, no. You only can make inferences, you know. Yeah. And uh, so we have to, uh, to create uh, a model Yes. of this possible structure of yes. the unconscious because we can't see it. Yes. Now, you see, he came to the uh, concept of the unconscious uh, 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 chiefly on the basis of, ex of the same experience I had made in the association experiment, namely that people reacted they say things, they did things without knowing that they did it or said it. Yes. Uh, uh, and this is something you can observe experimentally in the association experiment where people cannot remember afterwards what they did or what they said in the moment where the stimulus world hits the complex. Yeah. With the reproduction, in the so-called reproduction experiment, you go through the whole list and uh, you will see that the, uh, the, uh, 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 the memory uh, fails where there was a, a complex reaction. Yeah. And uh, that is uh, the, the, the simple fact uh, yeah. Freud had based his idea of the unconscious on. Because it, that is kind of what you can see yeah. time and again that people, for instance, make a mistake in speech. Yeah or that they say something which I didn't mean to say, yeah. uh, that j just uh, uh, make ridiculous mistakes, yeah. you know. Yeah. Uh, there are no end of stories, you know, you yeah. know about how people can betray themselves by uh, saying something they didn't mean to say yeah. at all, yet in the unconscious meant, 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 meant yeah. thing to say that thing, just that thing. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, for instance, when you uh, want to ex express your sympathy uh, at a funeral, you wrote to somebody and you say, I congratulate you, you say, uh, that's pretty painful, you know, but that happens, and, yeah. and it is true. Yeah. 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 Now, uh, this is uh, something that goes parallel now with the whole uh, uh, school of the uh, Sapetrière. 
in, in Paris, uh, Adela Pierre Gernet, who has worked out that side of the unconscious reactions uh, quite particularly. Yes. Now Freud uh, uh, refers very little to Pierre Gernet. Well, I, I, I have studied yes. with uh, Pierre Gernet in, Par in Paris, yes. and, uh, and uh, he has formed uh, my ideas very much. He uh, was a first-class observer, Though he had no dynamic theory about, uh, uh, no psychological theory, yes. it was a sort of physiological theory yes. uh, of uh, the unconscious phenomena as a so-called abaissement du niveau mental, yes. that means a, a, a certain depotentiation of the, of the tension of consciousness. Yes. Uh, it sinks below the level of, 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 of consciousness and thus becomes unconscious. Yes. Now, uh, that is right, view too. Yes. Only he says it sinks down because it, it is helped, it is repressed yes. from above. Yes. Yes. Then uh, that was my first point of difference with Freud. Yes. I say there are cases, in my observation, where there was no repression from above, but the thing itself is true. Yes. The, the, those contents that became unconscious had withdrawn all by themselves. Yes. They were not repressed. Yes. On the contrary, yes. Yes. they have a certain autonomy. There I discovered the concept of autonomy. Yes. And that these uh, uh, contents that disappear uh, have the power to move independently from my will, either. They appear when I want to say something definite, they interfere and, and say and speak themselves instead of what I wanted to say. Yeah. Or they make me do something which I didn't want to do at all. Yeah. Or they withdraw in the moment where I want to, to use them. Yeah. They certainly disappear. So one of the most extreme views that we have, or one of the very men that you knew around Dr. Foy, we mentioned a moment ago, Otto Rock. He spoke yes. of the birth trauma. He said the actual trauma of being born would leave a, uh, a very uh, powerful impact on the ego and, and show itself throughout the life of the person. Well, I should uh, say this is very important for an ego that it is born. Yeah. <laughs> 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 it wouldn't be. <laughs> Highly traumatic, you know, yes. when you fall out of heaven. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, you, uh, you, uh, will you take uh, literally uh, uh, Adorant's position of the trauma as having, you might say, a psychological effect? Don't you see, this is an event that happens to everybody that e exists, that once had been born. So everybody is born, has undergone that trauma, and so the, 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 the word trauma has lost its, its mm -hmm. meaning, I think. So, yeah, because it's a, it's, a, it's a general fact, of which you cannot say it is a trauma. Yeah. It is just a fact. Yes, yes, I see. You see, because then you cannot observe a, a, a psychology that hasn't been born. Yes. Only then you could say what the, what the word trauma is. Yeah. And then, until then, you cannot even speak of such a thing. Yeah. It's just a lack of, uh, of uh, epistemology. Now, Dr. Hume, we've been talking about the early oral level, and, and as you pointed out, you, you want to look at it rather literally as sort of a hunger drive or a drive for nutrition. Now, another rather fundamental uh, point in development of the ego, as the uh, more or less orthodox psychoanalytic view follows, is that uh, there is then this is followed by another critical level, an anal level development. Uh, well, one can use such terminology uh, because it is a fact that uh, children are exceedingly interested in all orifices of the body and doing all, they are doing all sorts of disgusting things, you know. Yeah. And sometimes this, uh, such a peculiarity keeps on into later life, you know, it is quite astonishing what you can hear in, in that respect. Now, it is equally true that people who have such preferences also develop a peculiar character. Uh, in early childhood, uh, the, a character is already there. You see, the child is not born tabula rasa, as one assumes. 
Yes. The child is born at a high complexity. Yes. With existing determinants yes. that never waver for the whole life. And that gives the child his, char his character already in the earliest childhood. A mother recognizes the indi an individuality of her child. And, uh, and so if you observe carefully, you see the tremendous difference even in, in very small children. And these peculiarities express themselves in every way. So it, first the peculiarities express, express themselves in, in all childish activities, in the way how it plays in the things it is interested in. There are children who are tremendously interested in all moving things and in movement chiefly. Yes. All the things they see that affect the body. And so they are interested in what the eyes do, what the ears do, how, uh, how far you can bore into the nose with your finger, yes. you know. They will do the same with the anus. They will do with their, uh, whatever they please, with their uh, genitals, you know. These interests uh, uh, express themselves in it typically childish way in, ch in children, and later on they express themselves in other peculiarities, yeah. uh, which are still the same, but it doesn't come from the fact that they once have done such and such a thing in, in, in childhood. Yeah. It, it, it is the character that is doing it. Yeah. There is, there is a, a definite inherited complexity and if you want to know something about possible reasons, you must go to the parents. So in any case of a child, a, a, a child neurosis, I go back to the parents and see what, they, what there is going on. You know, because children have no psychology of their own literally taken. They are so much in the mental atmosphere of the parents, so much of participation mystic with the parents. Yeah. They are imbued by the paternal or maternal atmosphere and they express these influences in their childish way. Yeah. So for instance, a child, take for instance an illegitimate child, they are uh, particularly exposed to, uh, to uh, environmental difficulties, for instance, the misfortune of the mother, etc., etc., and all the complications. And such a, such a child will miss, uh, for instance, a father. Yeah. Now, in order to compensate for it, they, uh, uh, it is just as if they are choosing or nominating a part of their body for a father yeah. instead of the father, and they develop, for instance, masturbation. Yeah. Yeah. That, is, that is very often so with, with uh, uh, illegitimate children that they become terribly erotic. Yes, yeah. even criminal. One of the central parts of the so-called psychosexual development in the more or less orthodox psychoanalytic theory is the so-called Oedipus complex. Yes, yes, yes. I believe the term complex was yours originally. Uh, well, you see, that is just uh, what I call an archetype. That yes. is the first archetype Freud has discovered. The first and the only one. He thinks that this is the archetype. Of course, there are many such archetypes. You look at Greek mythology and you find any amount of them, or look at dreams and you find any amount of them. Uh, but incest was so impressive to him that he even has chosen the, uh, the term Oedipus complex because that was one of the outstanding examples of an incest complex. Yeah. Uh, and it is only the, the masculine form, mind you, yeah. because women have an incest complex too, but there it is not an Oedipus. Yeah. So, but it is something else. Yes, yeah. yes. Yeah. So it is only the, the term for an archetypal way of behavior uh, in, in case uh, of a man, a man's relation, say, to his mother. Uh, he also means uh, to the daughter, because whatever he was to the mother, he will be it to, to the daughter, too. Yes. It yes. can be this way or that way. Yes. It depends. So, you look at, then you will accept, in other words, the, uh, the Oedipus uh, complex 
but not in as being the only important such influence. You will see this is just one of many. Is one, one, of of many. one of many. Of many ways of behavior. Now you see, the Oedipus gives you an excellent example of uh, the behavior of an archetype. It, it is all the whole situation. It is, it is, there is a mother, there is a father, there is a son, uh, there is a whole story, uh, how such a situation develops, and to what, and it leads uh, finally. Yeah. Uh, and that is an archetype. You see, an archetype always is a sort of abbreviated drama. Namely, it begins in such and such a way, it extends to such and such a complication, and it finds a solution in such and such a way. That is the usual uh, form, uh, as for instance, you, you take the, the instinct of building a nest with birds. Yeah. In the way they build the nest, there is the beginning, the middle, and the end. Yeah. It is built just to suffice for a certain number of uh, young. Uh, so, you see, the end is already anticipated. Uh, and that's the reason why in the archetype itself there is no time. It, it is a, a timeless condition where uh, beginning, middle and end are just the same. They are all given in one. Yeah. Now that is only a hint to what the archetype can do, you know. Yeah. But uh, that's a complicated yeah. question. Well, well <laughs> you know what a behavior pattern is. Yeah. Now, uh, the way in which, uh, say, a weaver uh, bu builds its nest, that is an inherited form in him. He will apply all certain symbiotic phenomena uh, between insects and plants. They are inherited patterns of behavior. And so man has, of course, an inherited uh, scheme of functioning. You see, his liver and his heart and all his organs and his brain will always function in a certain way, uh, 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 following its pattern. We only have a great difficulty of seeing it because we cannot compare. We, 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 there are no other similar beings like man uh, that are articulate yeah. and could uh, 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 give account of yeah. their functioning. If that were the case, we would know, oh, I don't know what, but because we have no means of comparison, we are necessarily unconscious about our own conditions, but it is quite certain that uh, man is born with a certain functioning, a certain way of functioning, a certain pattern of behavior. And uh, that is expressed in the form of archetypal images or archetypal forms. For instance, the way in which a man should behave is given by an archetype. Yeah. And therefore, you see, the primitives tell their stories. Uh, a great deal of education goes through storytelling. Yeah. Uh, for instance, they call in a palaver of the young men and uh, to older men perform before the eyes of the younger all the things they should not do. <laughs> yeah. And at the end they say, now that is exactly the thing you shall not do. Another way is, they tell them of all the things they should not do. Yeah. They tell them, and you like the decalogue, yeah. thou shalt not. Yes, yeah. yes. Yeah. And, uh, and that is always um, uh, supported by uh, mythological tales. Yeah. For instance, our ancestors have done so and so. Uh, uh, and so you shall do. Yeah. Or such and such a hero has done so and so, yeah. and uh, that is your uh, model. Yeah. For instance, the, uh, the teaching of the Catholic Church, there are uh, several thousand saints, yeah. and they show us how, you see, they model and become they models, models yeah. and, and they have their legends, and that is uh, Christian mythology. Yeah. In Greek, you know, there was a Theseus, there was a Heracles, uh, models of fine men, of gentlemen, you know. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, and they teach us how to behave. They are archetypes. I see. I archetypes see. of behavior. 
Nou, zie, die altijd is er voor, ze had een autonomie. Ik kan... Suddenly sees you. It is like a seizure. Ja. Yeah. So, for instance, falling in love at first sight, yeah. that is such a case. You see, you have a certain image in yourself without knowing it, of the woman, of the real woman. Yeah. Now you see that girl, or at least a good imitation of, of your type. Yeah. And instantly you get a seizure, and you're, you're gone. Yeah. And afterwards you may discover that it was a hell of a mistake. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> or you see, a man is quite capable Oh, he's intelligent enough to see that that woman of his choice, as one says, not no choice, he has been captured. Yeah. You know, he sees that he sees no good at all, yeah. that she is a hell of a business. And, and he, he tells me so, and he says, for God's sake, doctor, help me to get rid of that woman. He can't. <laughs> he's, he's like clay in her fingers. And that is the archetype. That is so for the archetype of the animal. Yeah, yeah. He, he thinks it is all his soul. Well, you know, that is a bit complicated, you know. Uh, the animal is, is an archetype, uh, an archetypal form expressing the fact that a man has a minority of feminine or female uh, genes. Yeah. And that is something that doesn't appear, it disappear in him, that is constantly present. And it works as a female in a man. Therefore, already in the 16th century, uh, the humanists have discovered that man has an animal. I see. And that yeah. uh, each man carries his female with himself, I said. Yes. Yeah. That so is not an, a modern invention. Yes. Yeah. So uh, now you see. Uh, the same is the case with the animus, that is a masculine image in a woman's mind, uh, which is not ex sometimes quite conscious, sometimes it is not conscious, but it is called into life the moment that woman meets a man who says the right things. I see. And then because he said it, it is all true, and he is, he is the fellow, yeah. no matter what he is. Yeah. So, uh, to uh, take, to, to refer to those yeah. are particularly well-founded archetypes, yeah. th those two. And uh, there you can lay hands on the basis, as it were, uh, uh, of, of, of the archetype. Uh, they are exceedingly well-defined. Uh. So, Dr. Hume, uh, we have been discussing uh, in some detail, some of the factors in the development of the personality of the individual, we, and you have very kindly uh, elaborated for us uh, on some of your fundamental concepts. I wonder if you would uh, mind telling us a little bit about how you uh, construe this term persona. Yes, well, this is a, a practical concept we need uh, in elucidating people's relation. Um, I noticed uh, with my uh, uh, patients, particularly with uh, people that are in, uh, in public life, that they have a certain way of uh, presenting themselves. Uh, for instance, take the doctor. He uh, has a, a certain way, for instance, he has good bedside manners. And, and uh, uh, he behaves as one expects a doctor behaves. He may even identify himself with it and, uh, and believe that he is what he appears to be. Yeah. Uh, he must appear in, in a certain form, unless uh, people don't believe that he is a doctor. And so when he is a professor, he is also supposed to behave in a certain way so that it is plausible that he is a professor. You know. So the persona is partially uh, the result of the demands society has. And on the other side, it is a, a, a compromise with what one likes to be, or with what, or as one likes to appear, uh -huh. say. Yeah. Um, so, uh, take, for instance, uh, a parson. He also has his particular manner, and uh, as 
corresponding to the general expectation and he behaves also in, in, in another way combined with his persona that is forced upon him by society in such a way that also his fiction of himself, his idea about himself, uh, is more or less uh, portrayed or uh, represented. Uh, so the persona is a certain, certain complicated system of behavior which is partially dictated by society and partially dictated by the expectations or the wishes uh, one nurses oneself. Yes. Uh, now, this is not the real personality, in spite of the fact that people will assure you that it is, that is all quite real and uh, quite honest, uh, yet it is not. Yes. Now, uh, such a uh, performance or, uh, say, yeah, the, the performance of the, uh, of the persona uh, is quite all right as long as you know that you are not identical with the way in which you appear. Yes. But uh, if you are unconscious of this fact, then you uh, get into uh, sometimes very disagreeable conflicts, namely people will, uh, can't help noticing that at home, for instance, you are quite different from what you appear to be in public. Yeah. And people who don't know it uh, stumble over it in the end. Uh, they deny that they are like that, but they are like that. They yes. are it. And then you don't know, now, which is the real man? Yes, yes. Is he the man as he is at home or in intimate relations? Or is he uh, the man that appears in public? It is a question of Jekyll and Hyde. Yes. Often. Yes. It is such, a, uh, uh, occasionally there is such a difference that you would almost be uh, able to speak of uh, the uh, double personality. Yes. And uh, the more that is pronounced, the more people, uh, people are neurotic. Yes. They get neurotic because they have two different ways. They are contradict themselves all the time. And then just, in as much as they are unconscious of themselves, uh, they don't know it. They think they are all one. Everybody sees that they are two. Yeah. And some know him only from one side, so others know him only from the other side. And then there are situations that clash, because it, the way you are creates certain situations in, with people in relations, and uh, these, these two situations don't chime in. They, they are just uh, uh, dissonances. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and the more that is the case, the more the people are neurotic. What now, you also use the term self. Yes. Now, uh, the word self, then, uh, would this have a different meaning than, say, ego? Oh, or yes, oh, yes. Right. oh, yes. You see, uh, when I say self, then you mustn't think of I myself, because that is only your empirical self, and yes. that is covered by the term ego. Ego, yes. But when it is a matter of the self, then it is a matter of a personality that is more complete than the ego, because the ego is only consists of what you are conscious of. Yes, yes. Your awareness. Yes. Yeah. What you know to be yourself. Yes. The whole personality of man is indescribable. Yes. The, his consciousness can be described. His unconscious cannot Not be described, described because the unconscious, as I must repeat myself, yes. is always unconscious. Yes. And it is really unconscious. It <laughs> really does not know it. <laughs> does not know about it. And so we don't know our, uh, our unconscious personality. We have hints. We have uh, certain ideas. Uh, but uh, we don't know it really. Nobody can say where man ends. And that is the, uh, the beauty of it, you know. Yeah. It's, it's very interesting. Yeah. Uh, it, it, the unconscious of man can reach God knows where. There we are going to make discoveries. Yeah, yeah. Now, another uh, uh, set of ideas center around the, the terms introversion and extroversion. It is simply practical because there are certain people who definitely are more uh, influenced by their surroundings than by their own uh, intentions. 
while other people, while there are other people who are more influenced by the subjective factor. Now you see, the subjective factor, that's very characteristic, was understood by Freud as a sort of pathological uh, or auto-erotism. Yeah, yeah. Uh, now this is a mistake. Uh, you know, we have, uh, the psyche has two conditions, two important conditions. The one is the envi environmental influence, yeah. yes. and the other is the given fact of the, the, of the psyche as it is born. The psyche is by no means tabula rasa, we are a definite mixture and combination of genes, yeah. and they are there from the very first moment of our life. And they give a definite character, even to the little child. And that is a subjective factor, looked at from the outside. Now, if you look at it from the inside, yes. then it is just so as if you would observe the world. Yes. When you observe the world, you see, you see houses, you see the sky, uh, you see tangible objects. But when you observe yourself within, you see moving images. Yeah. A world of images, yeah. uh, generally known as fantasies. Fantasy. Uh, yet these uh, fantasies are facts. You see, it is a fact that a man has such and such a fantasy. And it is such a tangible fact, for instance, that when a man has a certain fantasy, uh, another man may lose his life. Yeah. Or uh, a bridge is built. Yeah. These houses were all fantasies. Yeah. Everything you do here, all of right. us, everything was fantasy to begin with. And the fantasy has a proper reality. It is, that is not to be forgotten, fantasy is not nothing. It is of course not a tangible object, but it is a fact nevertheless. It is, a, a, see, a form of energy. Yeah. Despite the fact we can't measure it. Yeah. It is a manifestation of something. And that is a reality, that is just a, a, a reality as, for instance, the Peace Treaty of Versailles or something like that. Yeah. It is no more, you can't show it, yes. but it, 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 it has been a fact. Yes. Yes. And, and so uh, the, the psychical events are facts, are realities. And when you observe the stream of images within, you observe an aspect of the world. Yeah of the world within. Because the psyche, you know, if you understand it as a phenomenon that takes place in so-called living bodies, uh, then it is a quality of matter. As our body consists of matter, we discover that this matter has another aspect, namely a psychic aspect. Yeah. Yeah. And so it is simply the world from within, seen from within. Yes. It is just as if we were seeing in another, into another aspect of matter. And so, you see, the man who is going by the external world, by the influences of the external world, say, society or perceptions, uh, sense perceptions, thinks that he, he is more valid, you know, because this is valid, this is real. And the man who goes by the subjective factor is not valid because subjective is nothing. Yeah. No, that man is just as well based because he is based, bases himself upon uh, the world from within. Yeah. And so he is quite right even if he says, oh, there is nothing but my fantasy, you know. Yeah. And of course that is the introvert. And that's the introvert is always afraid of the external world, he will tell you, when you ask him, he, he, he will be apologetic about it. Yes. He will say, of course, yes, I know, it's only my fantasies, and, uh, and he has always resentment. And as the world in general, particularly America, is extroverted like hell, <laughs> uh, the, the, the introvert has no place. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, he, uh, because he doesn't know that he beholds the world from within. Yeah. And that gives him dignity, and that gives him certainty, because it is, nowadays particularly, the, the, the world hangs on a thin thread. Yeah. 
And that is the psyche of man. Assume that uh, certain fellows in Moscow lose their nerve or their uh, common sense uh, for a bit. And uh, the whole world is in fire and, uh, and flames. Yeah, yeah. And he, it is, nowadays we are not threatened by uh, elementary catastrophes. There is no such thing uh, as an age bomb. That is all man's doing. Yeah. We are the great danger. The psyche is the great danger. Yeah. What if something goes wrong with the psyche? Yeah. Huh. Yeah. You see? Right. And uh, so you see, it is, it is demonstrated to us in our days what what the power of the psyche is of man. How important it is to know something about it, but we know nothing about it. No, nobody would uh, would give credit to, to the idea that uh, the psychical uh, 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 processes of the ordinary man have any importance whatever. One thinks, oh, he has just uh, what he has in his head. It is all from his surrounding, his thoughts, such and such a thing, beliefs, such and such a thing. And particularly if he is well housed and well fed, then he has no ideas at all. Yeah. And that, that's the great mistake. Because he is just that as which he is born, and he is not born as tabula rasa, but, but as, as a reality. Would you perceive the world being made up of only people or extreme introverts, people that are extreme extroverts? Well, you know, Bismarck once said, uh, 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 God may protect me uh, against my friends. With my enemies, I can deal myself alone. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, you know how people are. They have, a, they catch a word, and then everything is schematized along that, that word. There is no such thing as a pure extrovert or a pure introvert. Yeah. That such a man uh, would be in the lunatic asylum. This is, those are only terms to designate a certain function, a certain tendency. For instance, the tendency to be more influenced by environmental influences or more influenced by the, the subjective factor. That's all. Yeah. And you see, there are uh, people who are very well balanced and are just as much influenced from within as they are from without, yeah. or just as little. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and so with all the, the, the finest classifications, you know, yeah. They, they are only a uh, um, sort of point de repère, uh, points for orientation. My whole scheme of, of typology is merely uh, a sort of orientation, uh, namely there is such a factor as introversion, there is such a factor as extraversion. The classification of individuals means nothing, nothing at all. It, this is only um, uh, the instrumentarium yeah. for the psycholo practical psychologists yeah. uh, to explain, for instance, a husband to a wife or vice versa. For instance, it is uh, very often the case, one could almost say, it is almost a rule, but I don't want to make too many rules with it. <laughs> in order not to be schematic, yeah. uh, that an, an introvert marries an extrovert for compensation, or another type marries the counter type to, to complement himself, for instance. Well, Dr. Jung, of course, uh, tied in with your typology and quotation marks of introversion and extroversion, uh, we, uh, of course, know of your concepts of thinking, feeling, sensation, and intuition. Well, there is a quite a simple explanation uh, of these uh, terms and it, it shows at the same time how I arrived at uh, such a uh, uh, typology. Uh, namely, a sensation tells you that there is something. Thinking, roughly speaking, tells you uh, what it is. Feeling tells you whether it is agreeable or not, mm -hmm. to be accepted or not, accepted or rejected. Yes. And intuition now there is a, a difficulty. Yes. You don't know ordinarily how intuition works. 
So when a man has a hunch, you can't tell exactly how he got at that hunch or where that hunch comes from. Uh, it is something funny about intuition. Uh, I will tell you a little story. I have yes, two do. patients. Uh, the, the man was a sensation type and the woman was an intuitive type. Of course, they felt attraction. <laughs> and so they took a little boat and went out to the lake of Zurich. And, uh, and there were those uh, birds that dive off the fish, you know. Yeah. And then after a certain time they come up again and you can't tell where they come up. And so they began to pit. Who the first was the first to, uh, to see the bird. Now, you would think that the one who observes reality very carefully, the sensation type, would of course win out. Yes. Not at all. The woman won the bet completely. Yes. She, she, beat, she uh, was beating him on all points. Yes. Uh, because by intuition she knew it before. I see. <laughs> now, how is that possible? Yeah. Uh, well, sometimes, you know, you can really find out how uh, it works uh, by finding the intermediate links. You see, it is a, a perception uh, uh, by uh, intermediate links and you only get the result of that whole chain of yeah. associations. Yeah. Sometimes you succeed in finding out, yeah. but more often you don't. So my definition is intuition is a perception by ways or means of the unconscious. Yeah. That is as near as I can get. Uh, now this is a very important function because when you live under primitive conditions, a lot of unpredictable things are likely to happen. Yeah, yes. And there you need your intuition because you cannot possibly tell by your uh, um, perceptions, by your sense perceptions, what there is going to happen. For example, more specifically, what would be an uh, example or a difference between an, an intuitive extrovert and an, an intuitive introvert? Uh, well, you know, the, you have chosen <laughs> a, a, a somewhat difficult uh, case, you know, because the one of the most difficult types is the intuitive introvert, yes, you know. Uh, yes. uh, the intuitive effects that you find among hunters, bankers, yes, gamblers. Yes, yes, uh, yes. Uh, uh, well, that is quite understandable. Yes. But the introvert is, is uh, the introvert uh, variety is more difficult because he has intuitions as to the subjective factor, namely the inner world. Yeah. And of course that is now very difficult to understand uh, because what he sees uh, are most uncommon things and uh, he doesn't like to talk of them yeah. if he's not a fool because he, he, he would uh, spoil his own game by doing what he sees because people won't understand it. Yeah. Um, <coughs> for instance, once I, I had a, mm. a young woman, about 20, 27 or 8, and her first words were, when I had seated her, she said, you know, doctor, I come to you because I have a, a, a snake in my abdomen. Mm. I said, what? <laughs> uh, yes, a snake. Uh, a black snake coiled up right in the, in, 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 in the bottom of my abdomen. And I must have made a rather uh, bewildered uh, face at her. And she said, you know, uh, I, I, I don't mean it literally, uh, <laughs> but uh, I should say it was a snake. It was a snake. <laughs> <laughs> now, you see, our further conversation a little later was, as she said, uh, that was about in the middle of our treatment that only lasted for 10 consultations. She, she had foretold me, I come 10 times and then it's all right. I said, how do you know? Oh, I got a hunch, you see. Yeah. And, and really, uh, about the fifth or sixth hour, she said, doctor, I must tell you, uh, the, the snake has risen. It is now about here. 
uh, hunch. And then, in, in, uh, on the tenth day, I say, now, this is our last hour. And do you feel cured? And she, she said, beaming, she said, you know, this morning, it came up <laughs> and came out of my mouth and the head was golden. Mm. I tell those were her last words. Mm. Now, you see that same girl, when it, came, came, when it comes to reality, she came to me because she couldn't hear the step of her, of her, uh, of her feet anymore. Yeah. Because she walked on air. Yeah. Literally. Yeah. She couldn't hear it. And that, that frightened her. And when she came to me, I asked her for her, her address. And then she said, oh, pension so-and-so. Uh, well, it is not just cow called pension, but it is a sort of pension. And it is, uh, I never had heard of it. Yeah. And uh, I said, now, are you curious? I never have heard of that place. Well, it's a very nice place, she said. Uh, you're curious enough, there are only young girls there, very nice and very lively young girls. And they have a merry time. I often wish they would invite me to their merry evenings. And uh, I said, but uh, uh, they amuse themselves all uh, alone. Said, oh, no, there are plenty of young gentlemen coming in. And uh, they have a, a beautiful time, but they never invite me. It turned out that it was a private brother. Yes. <laughs> and she, she was a perfectly decent yeah. girl, you know, of a very good family. Not from here. She, yeah. she, 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 she had found that place, I don't know how. And, and she was utterly unaware that they also were all prostitutes. <laughs> she said, for heaven's sake, you, you fell in the, into, into a very dark place. You, you, you hasten to get out of it. <laughs> uh, that is was her sensation. Yeah, see, she yeah. doesn't see, see, see reality. Yeah. Yeah. But she had hunches like anything, and they yeah. came off. Yeah. Now, you see, such a person cannot possibly speak of uh, of her experiences yeah because everybody would think she's absolutely crazy yeah i myself was was quite shocked when i thought for heaven's sake is that case a, a schizophrenia yeah, yeah. because uh, you don't hear that kind of speech right. but she assumed that the old man of course knows everything and he even doesn't under, uh, understand such kind of language <laughs> yeah. uh, so you see, if uh, when or when the in, intuitive uh, um, uh, the uh, intolerant intuitive yes. uh, would speak what he really perceives, then practically nobody would understand it. He would be misunderstood, and so they learn to keep things to themselves. And you hardly ever hear them talking of these things. That is a great disadvantage. But it is an enormous advantage in another way. Uh, not to speak of the uh, experience they have got in that uh, respect, but also in human relations. For instance, they come into the presence of somebody they don't know. And certainly they have inner images. And those inner images give them a more or less complete information about the psychology of the partner. Yeah. yeah. You know, that is, uh, but it of case can also happen that they come into, pre into the presence of somebody who they don't know at all, not from Adam, and they know an important piece out of the biography of that person. Yes, yes. And are not aware of, of it, and tell the story. Yes. Uh, and then the cat is in the fire. Yeah, that's right. You see, so the the introvert, the intuitive, is is uh, has a, in a way a, a very difficult life, although one of the most interesting lives. Yeah. But it is difficult often to get into their confidence. It's just a, a sort of uh, a skeleton uh, yeah. to which you have to add the, the flesh, or uh, say you it is. Uh, a country mapped out, you know, by uh, triangulation points. And uh, that doesn't mean the country consists of triangulation points. Yeah. That is only in order to, to have an idea of the distances. Yeah. And, and, and so it is uh, 
uh, a, a means to an end. It only makes sense uh, uh, such a scheme uh, when when you have when you deal with practical cases. Well, I, I told you that case of that intuitive girl. Yeah, yeah. Uh, who certainly uh, came out with the statement that she has a black snake in, in, yes, in the belly. Yes, yes. Well, now uh, that is uh, that is a collective symbol. Yes, that yes. is not a, an, in, an individual fantasy. That yes. is a collective fantasy. Yes. That, is a, that is a well known in India. Yes. Well, she, she has nothing to do with India. But uh, we have it too, which it was generally human. Yes. But it's entirely unknown. Yes. So, that I even in the first moment thought, uh, perhaps she's crazy. Yes. But she was only highly intuitive. Yes. It, it is in India known, it is a, the, the basis of a whole philosophical system of tantrism. Yes. Uh, it, this is Kundalini. Yes. Kundalini is uh, certain. I see. You see? And, uh, and that is something known to some few specialists. Yes. Uh, uh, generally it's not known that we have a, a certain uh, uh, in, in the abdomen. Yeah. Yes. But that is a collective, you see, yes. that is a yes. collective yes. dream yes. or a collective fantasy. Yes. It may be, you know, that what the unconscious has to say is so disagreeable that one prefers not to listen. Yes. And in, in most cases, uh, uh, people would be probably less neurotic if they could admit the, the things. Because these things are, are, are always a bit difficult or, or yes. disagreeable or uh, inconvenient or something yes. of the sort. So there is always a certain amount of repression, but that is not the main thing. Not the main thing. thing is that they are really unconscious. Yes. And uh, you see, if you are unconscious in, in, in about certain things that ought to be conscious, then you are dissociated. I see. And then you are uh, a man whose uh, uh, left hand never knows what the right is doing. Yes. Uh, and counteracts or interferes with the right hand. Yes. Now such a man is hampered all over the place. Yes. Yes. Then we have the problem. That is the problem for an intellectual man. And then I say, now, you see, you don't know. You have no answer. Yes. I have no answer. Yes. Now what are we going to do? Yes. I say, now we must see what you dream. Because the dream is the manifestation of the unconscious side. Uh -huh. Now you never have heard of the unconscious side. So I must explain to him that he has an unconscious yes. and that the dream is a manifestation of it. And if we, we succeed in analyzing the dream, we, we, we might get an idea about that power that makes him think like that. I see. In treatment, for instance, in the treatment of neurosis, you have to do with that personal unconscious for quite a while. And then only uh, dreams come that show that the collective unconscious is touched upon. Yes. Now, as long as uh, th uh, there uh, is material uh, for, for personal nature. Yes. You have to deal with the personal unconscious. Yes. But when you get to uh, uh, say to a question, um, to a problem, which is no more merely personal, but also collective, you get collective dreams. Yes. Yes. And then we are. Uh, there where we can begin with the observation of the unconscious. And then, day by day, one goes on by the data the unconscious produces. Yes. You see, we discuss the dream, and that gives a new surface to the whole problem. And uh, he, he will have another dream, and the, the next dream gives again an answer, because the unconscious is in a compensatory relation to consciousness. and. Uh, and after a while, we get the full picture. Yes. And if he has a full picture and uh, has the, the necessary moral stamina, uh, well, then he, he can be cured. I see, I see. But in the end, it is a moral question whether a man at this was he had learned or not. There is a sort of typical way in which the uh, integration of consciousness takes place. Namely, the, the, the average way is that um, through the analysis of dreams, for instance, you become acquainted with the contents of the unconscious. I already told you this to, to begin with all personal material, yes. um, subjective uh, questions, 
uh, questions of the individuals, uh, difficulties in adapting to uh, environmental uh, uh, conditions, and so on. Yes. Now, it is a regular uh, observation that when you talk to an individual, and this individual gives you um, uh, insight into its uh, uh, inner preoccupations, interests, emotions, the other words, uh, hands over uh, his uh, personal complexes, then you get slowly and nilly-willy into the situation of a, of a sort of authority, yeah. uh, uh, a point of, you become a point of reference. Um, you know you are in possession of all uh, the important items in a, in a person's development. I remember, for instance, I analyzed uh, a very well-known uh, American politician and uh, he told me, oh, any amount of the secrets of his trade. <laughs> and, uh, uh, and suddenly he jumped up and said, by God, what have I done? You know, you, you, you get a million dollars for what I have told you now. <laughs> and I said, well, uh, I'm not interested. You can sleep in peace, I shall not betray you. I forget it within a fortnight. <laughs> Uh, now, you see, that shows that uh, the things people hand out are not merely uh, indifferent things. When it comes to something important, emotionally important, then they hand out themselves. They hand out a big emotional uh, value, as if they were handing over a large sum as if they were trusting you with, uh, with the administration of their estate. Yes. And they're entirely in your hands. Yes. Uh, often, you, do, uh, you know, I hear things well, that could ruin those people, utterly fabulously ruin. Or uh, it, uh, it, it would give me, if I should have any blackmailing tendencies, uh, uh, unlimited power. To, to blackmail them. Now, you see, that creates an emotional relationship to the analyst. And that is what Freud called the transform, yes. which is a, a central problem of, um, uh, of analytic psychology. Uh, it is just so as if these people had handed out the their uh, whole existence and uh, that can have very peculiar effects upon the individual. E either they hate you for it or they love you for it, yeah. uh, but you are not indifferent to them. And uh, there is then a sort of emotional uh, relation uh, between the patient and uh, the doctor. Yes. Now, uh, you know, when you uh, hand out such materials, then you, uh, these uh, uh, contents are associated with all the important persons in the life of a patient. Now, the most important persons are usually father and mother, yeah. that comes up from childhood. The first troubles are with the parents as a rule. So, in handing over your infantile memories uh, about the father or about the mother, you hand over also the image of father and mother. Uh, then it is just as if the doctor had taken the place of the father. Yeah. Even of the mother. Yeah. I had quite a number of male patients that called me Mother Young. <laughs> because I handed over the mother to me. Yes, yes. Curiously enough. Yes. 
but you see that's quite irrespective, uh, irrespective of the personality of the, of the analyst. The distinctive is regarded, he functions as if he were the mother, or he functions as if he were the father, uh, the of central authority. And uh, uh, now that is what one calls transphonostatic case, a, a particular case of trans of, uh, of projection. Yes. Now yes. Freud doesn't exactly call it projection, he calls it transforms. Yes. Uh, that is uh, an allusion to the old uh, superstitious idea of handing over a disease, yeah. transferring a disease upon an animal, or <coughs> the handing over the sin upon a scapegoat, and yeah. the scapegoat takes it out into the desert and makes it disappear. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so they hand over themselves uh, in the hope that I can swallow that stuff and digest it for them. <laughs> and so I am in, 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 in local parties and have a high authority. Uh, naturally, I'm also persecuted by the correspondent uh, resistances, but all the, the manifold uh, emotional reactions they have had against their parents. Now, that is the stuff you have to work through first in analyzing the situation, because a patient in such a condition is not free, he is the slave, he is he's utterly dependent upon, uh, upon the doctor, uh, like a patient with an open abdomen on, on the operation table. Yeah. He is uh, in the hands of the surgeon for uh, better or worse, uh, and so the thing must be finished, and so we have to work through that condition in the hope that we arrive uh, on a, uh, in a situation where the patient is able to see that I'm not the father or not the mother, that I am an ordinary human being. Now, everybody naturally should assume that uh, such a thing would be possible, for instance, that, you, that a patient could arrive at such an insight when he's not a complete idiot, uh, that, that I am just a, a doctor and, and not an emotional figure of their uh, fantasies. But that is very often not the case. So I had a, a, a case that was a, an intelligent uh, 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 young woman. She was a, a student of philosophy, very good mind, where one could expect easily that she would see that I am not the, the, the uh, parental authority. But she was utterly unable to, uh, to get out of this delusion. Uh, and in such, in such a case, one, uh, one always has recourse to the dreams. One, uh, it is just as if one would ask the unconscious, now what do you say to such a condition? You see, she says of the unconscious, of course I know you are not my father, but I just feel like that, it is like that, it, 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 I depend upon you. And, uh, and I say, now we will see what the unconscious says. Now the unconscious produced dreams in, in which I really assumed a very curious role. You know, she was a little infant, she was sitting on my knees, I held her in my arms, I was a very tender father to the little girl, you know, and, uh, um, uh, and more and more, her dreams became emphatic in that respect, namely that I was a, a sort of child and, uh, and she is a very little frail human uh, thing, you know, and uh, uh, quite a little girl in the hands of an enormous being. Uh, and the last dream of that series was, I cannot tell you all the dreams, yeah. was that I uh, uh, it was out in nature, I stood in a field of wheat, you know, no field of wheat that was ripe for house. And I was a child. And I held her in my arm like a baby. And the wind was blowing over that field of wheat. Now you know when the wind is blowing over wheat field, these waves in the wheat field. Yeah, yes. And with these waves, I swayed like that, uh, putting her as if it were to sleep, you know. And she, feel, she felt 
uh, as being in the arms of a, of a god of, 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 of the godhead. Mm -hmm. See? Mm -hmm. And uh, so now, now the, the harvest is ripe, yeah. and I must tell her. And I told her, you see, what you want and what you project into me, because you are not conscious of it, is you, you, you have the idea of a deity. You don't possess. Therefore, you see it in me. Yeah. Uh, that clicked. Mm. Because, you know, she had a, a, a rather intense uh, religious education, of course, it all vanished later on, yeah. and something disappeared from her world. The world became merely personal, and and uh, the uh, that uh, religious conception of the world was non-existent apparently. But you see, the idea of a deity. Mm -hmm. It's not an intellectual idea, it is an archetype, it's an archetypal idea. Mm -hmm. Therefore, you, you find it practically everywhere under this or another name, you know, even if it has the name Mana, it is, it, it, it is uh, an all-powerful, uh, uh, extraordinary effect or uh, quality, uh, even if it's not personal at all. Uh, and so she suddenly became aware of an entirely heathenish image yes. um, that comes fresh from the archetype. She had not the idea of a Christian God uh, or of a uh, Old Testament Yahweh. Uh, it was a heathenish God, you see, a, a, a God of nature, of vegetation. He was the wheat himself, he was the spirit of the wheat, uh, the spirit of the wind. And she was in the arms of that human. No. Now, that is the living experience of an archetype. Now, that made a tremendous impression upon that girl. And instantly, it clicked. She saw what she really was missing, that missing value, that, uh, that was, was in the form of a projection in myself and made myself indispensable to her. Yes. And then she saw it is not indispensable because it is, as the dream says, she is in the arms of uh, that uh, archetypal yes. uh, uh, idea. Now that is a luminous experience, you see. And, and that is the thing that uh, people are looking for. Yes. The, an archetypal experience that gives them uh, 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 an incorruptible value uh, in as much as she can realize such a luminous experience uh, she is able to continue her path her way her individuation the acorn can become an oak uh, and, and, and not a donkey it, uh, 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 nature will take uh, uh, her course. Uh, she will become that which she is from the beginning. Uh, now, uh, we think we are able to be born today and to live in no myth, in, without history. That's, that's, that is a, a disease that's absolutely abnormal because man is not born every day. He is once born in, in a specific historical setting with the specific historical qualities and therefore he is only complete when he has a relation to, to these things. It's just as if you were born without eyes and ears uh, when, you are born, when you are growing up with no connection with the past. From natural, the standpoint of natural science, you need no connection with the past. You yes. can wipe it out. Yes, yes. And that is... That is a, a, a mutilation of, of, of the human being. Now I saw uh, through my practical experience that uh, uh, this uh, kind of proceeding uh, had a most extraordinary therapeutic effect. And so you see, in our days, we have such and such a uh, view of the world, such and such a philosophy. Um, but in the unconscious, we have a different one. 
And that, as we can see in, uh, through the example of the alchemistic philosophy, that behaves towards the medieval consciousness exactly like the unconscious behaves to ourselves. And we can construct or even predict our, uh, the, the, the unconscious of our days when we know what, what it has been yesterday. Now that is, uh, in a, with a few words, uh, uh, the development uh, of my ideas.